Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's uh, Josh Frost. I am uh, work with the Thames Discovery Programme. Uh, some of you who are in the session yesterday would have heard a bit about the Thames Discovery Programme, but we're gonna, I'm going to kind of uh, look in a bit more uh, depth about uh, what we do. Um, the liquid history comes from a quote from a, a, a politician called John Burns, who was a 19th century politician, who in true 19th century Britishness, when an American uh, moaned about the dirtiness of the River Thames, um, said, Sir, the Thames is liquid history, um, with the kind of confidence that only a 19th century British man could do. So that's kind of where we're starting with. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, the Thames Discovery Programme is uh, a community archaeology programme. We've been running for about 10 years. Um, we're hosted uh, by MOLA, Museum of London Archaeology. Um, and th uh, th uh, so part of our work is funded through them. Part of our work is funded through um, the City Bridge Trust, who maintain um, a number of bridges in the City of London, um, and also by uh, Tideway, who are in the middle of constructing a massive super sewer underneath the river to clean up. Um, uh, the river. As a project, uh, we've been, as I said, running for 10 years, uh, but we have um, predecessor organisations, um, the Thames Archaeological Survey, which ran in the 90s, um, and before that, a lot of very interested archaeologists. Um, a real kind of moving force behind the whole thing has been um, Gustav Milne, who's been heavily involved in the Citizen, which you've heard about earlier today. So without Gustav, uh, Steph and myself wouldn't be here doing these uh, these papers, so a lot of the credit can, uh, does go to him. Um, as I said, we're a community archaeology programme, so we train volunteers. These are some of our volunteers uh, at a site in Rotherhithe, uh, in uh, the South Bank in East London, um, doing some uh, recording. We train our volunteers um, in recording methods and familiarising themselves with the type of archaeology they can find on the foreshore. Uh, it normally run, at the moment it's running. It runs for four days, so as part of their training, they get a real sense of the archaeology, uh, and then they come down with us uh, to do uh, field work. We also do a lot of uh, public engagement work. Uh, my job is to go into schools and work with young people. Uh, so at the moment, we are running a group uh, for young people between the ages of eight and eighteen to do the same work as our adult volunteers, which is really exciting. Our adult volunteers, by the way, are called FROGS, which stands for the Foreshore Recording and Observation Group. So our junior volunteers are called tadpoles because they're little frogs. I quite like that. Um, but we also do a lot of lectures. Um, we have an extensive lecture program and workshops as well. What do we do then? Um, we divide the river into what we call foreshore zones, which are essentially sites. So each borough in London, uh, we divide into a certain number of sites. Um, we tend to try and visit as many sites as we can in a year, whether that's doing field work or just a kind of casual site visit, the three members of paid staff going down of a morning or an afternoon uh, to have a look. Uh, volunteers, uh, new volunteers are trained in the spring at our, our training events. Uh, but we have local groups that carry out regular monitoring trips throughout the year, even in kind of January, February, when even in London the weather is not particularly nice. Uh, and then field work is really the, the key uh, thing we do, and we do that at uh, sites which we consider really important sites or, or sites that are at risk. Uh, and we do, tend to do one site a month from April through to August. Um, so we've just finished our, our kind of main field work. Uh, program for the year. So that's what we do. Uh, and this is our patch. We look up, we look at the Thames within what we call Greater London. Um, so we go from Erith at the bottom left, no, the bottom right, um, right through to Richmond um, on the left. So it's quite a big patch. Um, and you can see by the number of numbers how many sites we're looking at here. Um, some of them are quite big and don't have much in them. Some of them are quite small and have a lot going on in them. So it's a really dynamic environment to be working in. Um, in terms of climate change on the Thames, uh, as you can imagine, being a big city on a river, there is a lot going on, a lot of potential risks. Uh, this is 1928, this is the Tower of London. This was the last time there was water in the moat of the Tower of London. 
and this is because there was a massive flood in 19, the last kind of fatal flood uh, in London that claimed a large number of people's lives. Uh, so this is the last time that uh, the river flooded uh, the moat of the Tower of London. This is what can happen. Um, At the moment, this is what does happen. This is um, a site in West London called Strand on the Green. It looks very picturesque, uh, but as you can see, the, the river walk has flooded there. The main risks we get in London are from what we call from the storm surges coming in uh, from the estuary, but also fluvial flow coming where water is coming. A lot of, as we say, the river gets full. There's a lot of water coming down uh, into the river. Being an urban environment, we're, we're heavily concreted uh, and also our sewer system at the moment uh, is basically based around Victorian storm drains. So when there is any rain, all the excess water goes into the river. So there, there you know, as the climate changes, um, as, as big storm events become more common, there is a lot of risk for an urban environment like London. Uh, and also, we have an increase in kind of eco-friendly river travel. Uh, this, is this is Gus doing his bit, standing on a um, bit of a, a Tudor jetty. Uh, and as you can see in the background, there is a uh, Thames Clipper. There are a lot of Thames Clippers now, uh, more than there ever been. River travel is kind of touted by some as a kind of environmentally friendly alternative to the car or the bus or the tube. Um, and a lot of our sites tend to fall near quite heavy areas of uh, river traffic. And we'll, I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that uh, in a minute. So what I'm going to look at, uh, I'm going to look at two sites in particular in a minute and how they're affected by, by those factors. The other thing we've got is, is this. This is the Thames Barrier. Uh, this is London's, one of London's major flood protections. Um, opened in the 1980s. This is a view of it from one of our sites at Charlton. Um, however, the barrier was designed uh, only for about two or three uses a year. Um, however, as you can see, if you look at the, uh, that big spike a few years back, it is being used much, much more than it was designed to be used for. Uh, something like 77% of the closures of the Thames barrier have occurred in the last, uh, in the last kind of uh, 10 to 20 years. So there is a huge increase in the use, and that is from both storm surges coming in from the estuary, but also storm events coming uh, downriver as well. So there's about 12 years left uh, before the Thames Barrier has to be redesigned. Um, so it is a real pressing issue uh, in London how the river and, and uh, kind of operates. I should mention though, even though the Thames is tidal, it is essentially managed by the barrier and by a series of locks um, further up the river at Teddington. So even though it may appear to be a nice natural ebb and flow of tide, it is, it is still managed. It's a managed river, but we're still having issues with climate change, even though it's uh, a, man a managed river. Um, so the first site we're going to look at is Greenwich. Greenwich um, is, uh, as you can see, quite a nice place to work. The building in the foreground is actually the Trinity Laban um, Conservatoire. So if you're working down the site, sometimes you get serenaded by, by various music students playing, which is quite lovely on a Thursday morning at kind of eight o'clock. Um, the building is part of the old Royal Naval College. Uh, before that, it was uh, the Royal Hospital at Greenwich. Before that, uh, in the Tudor period in the 1500s, it was the pa Palace of Placentia, which was um, the favoured palace of Henry VIII. So it's a really major site in terms of history, uh, and it is a World Heritage site, uh, one of four that we have in London, all of which are on the river. Um, if you look uh, at this, uh, I'll get the mouse, hopefully, or actually I'll run across, it's going to be easier. Greenwich uh, is there. I realise London geography is not really helpful if you don't live in London. Um, in 2000, uh, over the years uh, of work, we've noticed uh, some timbers appearing on the foreshore here. You'll notice 
Uh, these were the ones Gus was standing on in an earlier picture. Um, what we've noticed over the years is these have become more and more exposed. Um, this is a very early picture. When the colleagues went to this site in the 90s, there was nothing visible on this stretch of foreshore. Um, but as you can see, slowly but surely, more and more timbers have become exposed. Uh, and, to, and more and more timbers have been lost by water action. This site is right next to a riverboat pier. So in the time that you're down there, in the kind of three hours that we tend to work uh, between tides, we can see as many as um, seven, eight, nine, ten riverboats going past. And they do not go past slowly. They go past very quickly. Uh, and the wash comes in, and that is what is causing the erosion. You also see there's some... Um, uh, the, the foundations of the river all became exposed here, which is what the, um, the rock armouring at the bottom is for. Uh, our other site, it, another key site, another World Heritage site, uh, that Helen mentioned yes, I know I mentioned yesterday, is uh, Tower of London. But interestingly, there's, there's talk about its World Heritage status being revoked. Uh, that was in the news uh, yesterday. Uh, again, this is more in the city. You can see at the top, um, right, there's a whole flurry of red it's that's about where the Tower of London is. Um, this is 2012. You can see this is the foundations of the river all being exposed. Uh, and of course, the crack in the wall one year later. Uh, and the rock armoring was put in, temporary rock armoring was put in place in 2015. The stuff underneath the rock armoring was exposed by erosion. So even uh, where measures are put in place to prevent erosion, such as the amount of movement in the river, erosion is still taking place. Uh, and historic royal palaces who, who look after the Tower of London don't really want the bit in front of the Tower of London falling into the river because then the tourists won't be able to take their nice photos and it looks very bad. Um, to conclude, um, the key things that we found in our work, uh, the first thing you need really if you're doing work like of the type we're doing, is you need passionate trained volunteers who feel an ownership of the archaeology, who feel involved and invested in what they're doing. You need to be coordinating um, with local organisations. We work very closely with uh, the Environment Agency, Historic England uh, and Historical Palaces of Royal Naval College the people whose land we're, we're, we're working on. You have to be looking at sites regularly because if you're not, you're gonna come back two years later and it's all gone. Um, but I think there also needs to be a dialogue about the impacts of climate change on the archeology, span because if you don't, you're not gonna get anywhere. And a key thing for us is we have to engage the public. If the public don't know what's happening, then nothing's gonna change. Um, we live in, one of the biggest cities in Europe, so we have a real chance to engage people with the impacts of climate change in an urban environment and on the archaeology, which is really exciting. Thank you.